Hey guys, it's Landon Blake with Redefined Horizons, and today I'm doing part two of my review of the key concepts in chapter three of Brown's Boundary Control and the Principles, Brown's Boundary Surveying Bible. So in the first part of chapter three, the review, um, I told you I, I struggled a little bit with the kind of the logical structure of the chapter. It was a little bit jumbled to me just because my brain works differently than most people's. No, uh, no insult to Mr. Brown or his co-authors. So I kind of regrouped things a little bit to make it easier for me to understand and to teach. So in the first part, uh, I talked about some of the land title concepts that were in Brown chapter, Brown's chapter 3. In this part, part 2 of our review of chapter 3, I'm going to talk about land descriptions and a little bit about uh, title insurance and some alternatives to title insurance. Okay? So, Brown talks about land descriptions in Chapter 3, also known as legal descriptions. Um, I don't know if Brown talks about legal descriptions in another part of the book extensively. He may not. Uh, there's, Of course, there's Waddles, uh, which is a whole book just about land descriptions. But uh, Brown, Brown does talk quite a bit about legal, legal descriptions or land descriptions in Chapter 3. So what does he tell us? Uh, a couple key things. Uh, a description of land can be three-dimensional. So... Brown says it could be of rights below the land, like mineral rights, surface of the land, or above the land, airspace rights. So those descriptions can be three-dimensional. Uh, this is a, a key point he makes about terminology here. A deed is not a land description. A deed contains a land description. And so the, the, the language I like to use is the deed jacket versus the land description. So the deed jacket kind of encloses the land description. Right? That's just the way I, I like to remember it. So uh, surveyors don't, you don't survey the deed, you don't cogo the deed, you survey the land description in the deed, right? You cogo the land description in the deed. Uh, he talks a little bit more about conflicts and, he, and, and as they relate to land descriptions, he uh, indicates that conflicts can occur when a land description that defines a property right conflicts with another land description. So sometimes you have gaps and overlaps in land descriptions what could be a, a written land description in a deed conflicts, conflicts with the survey. So uh, you can have a deed that conflicts with a deed. See, I just did it. You can have a land description that conflicts with a land description, or you can have a land description that conflicts with a survey. Right? So that creates problems. When you have two land descriptions that get put on the ground with a gap or an overlap, it creates conflict in our real property system. He talks about the, uh, legal, the requirements for a deed to be legally valid. Okay, now we're talking about a, a deed here, not a land description. So, and each state has its own laws, but they're usually similar. But he talks about how you have to identify competent parties. What do we mean by competent? In other words, old enough and not insane, right? Able to make sound decisions. But you have to have some operative words of conveyance. So I grant or I convey or I transfer. There has to be some, some language in there. And uh, the third thing is, and this is really important for surveyors, you have to have a sufficient description of the real estate being conveyed. So if you have a crummy land description, that can, that can invalidate the deed, potentially. Right? So that's, it's really important that surveyors do a good job when they write land descriptions of writing a description that can only be put in the ground on one place and that doesn't create gaps or overlaps with adjoining descriptions. Mr. Browns points out that unqualified people prepare land descriptions all the time. That's one a source of conflicts in our real property system. So who, who, what kind of unqualified people? Landowners, attorneys, utility company employees, land title professionals, and Mr. Brown says even some land surveyors prepare crummy land descriptions. So just because you're a land surveyor doesn't mean you are qualified to write land descriptions. And I... I don't, it doesn't happen a lot, but I do occasionally run across land descriptions prepared by a land surveyor that are not up to snuff. So when you have an inadequate uh, land description in a deed, it creates problems, pre creates conflict. Uh, uh, Browns, again, teaches us that historical context is really important, and that's kind of a recurring theme in the book. That's why land surveyors have to know about history. Um, so one of the... One of the relationships between history and boundary surveying is that land descriptions have a historical context. In other words, that, that description of, a, of the land or a, of the property right, the physical description of where that is on the ground, was created at a certain time in history. 
in a certain place and there were customs and measurement techniques and uh, units of measurement that were in play at that particular time and if a surveyor is going to properly follow in the footsteps of that surveyor that created that description he needs to understand that historical context and so that's really important so if the if the land description is written in veras or chains you better use veras or chains when you retrace the description right okay he also mentions that um and I don't know why I just I hadn't thought about this, but distance measurements in a land description could be on on follow the slope of the train, or it could be horizontal. And so you got to look at historical context. Um, you know, when that was that surveyor pulling a distance along the terrain, or was he pulling a was he calculating a horizontal distance? And probably in most older surveys, he was pulling the distance along the slope, right? So you got to look you got to look at the historical con context. And I think the chapter. Chapter 3 even mentions that in some uh, parts of the United States, I think the eastern states, uh, the presumption under the law is slope distance, not horizontal. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, he also talks about how there's different types of basis of bearings. And again, historical context is important. He talks a lot about magnetic bearings and how you have to understand declination. Magnetic declination changes over time, and that changes the type of bearings you might get if you're using magnetic bearings. And he talks about how some states have presumptions about how magnetic bearings are used, and some states have legal presumptions that bearings control over distances. And so you have to, number one, you got to understand your historical context, and number two, you have to understand the, the laws that apply in your state. Uh, he also mentions that elevation contours can be a controlling call on a land description. I have had that before in my practice on more than one occasion, where a land description followed an elevation contour. They can be tricky. Uh, he talks about the four main parts of a land description. They've got a caption, a body, qualifying clauses, which take stuff away, and augmenting clauses, which add stuff to the main parcel that's being transferred. Uh, then he talks about the different kinds of land descriptions, perimeter, what I call meets, bounds, strip, aliquot, combination of the, those. So he talks about the different kinds of land descriptions. He also mentions briefly that if you have a course in a land description with more than one call, so if you say along the center line of the creek and the south line of the lands of Blake, that's two calls. Um, that can create a conflict potentially. Um, he, I think, he basically says, I think, trying to remember, don't do it. Um, I don't know if I agree with that 100%. In some circumstances, it can be appropriate to include more than one call, but I think you need to be really careful when you do it. Because he is correct. If it's not carefully done, it can create problems. There you go. That's what Browns has to say about Land descriptions in chapter three, some good information there. Remember, a deed does not equal a land description. A deed contains a land description. Then he talks a little bit about uh, land title abstracting and land title insurance. And he tells you, you know, why do we need land title insurance? We need land title insurance because only evidence of ownership is recorded, not proof, not conclusive proof of ownership is recorded. And so you can have conflicting evidence of ownership uh, down at your clerk and recorder, and so title insurance is part of how that all gets sorted out. The other reason is most buyers of real property are not sophisticated enough to determine if the seller has what we call marketable title or good title, so they need expert help to figure that out, and so title insurance is one way that we handle that challenge. Uh, he also mentions title insurance has some common exclusions to coverage. He says land surveyors should know what those common exclusions are. Land surveyors should understand how title insurance works. I agree with him 100%. He then mentions some alternatives to land title insurance. So maybe even alternatives is the wrong word. Maybe complements is, is a better word. But he talks about title abstractors. Those are professionals that research a chain of title and issue an opinion about a chain of title, but they are not lawyers. Then he talks about title opinions, which are prepared by a land attorney. And uh, they uh, review a chain of title potentially put together by an abstractor and issue an opinion on the quality of the title insurance. And there are, I think, even in modern days, times when it's appropriate to have a abstract title or chain of title prepared and to get a title opinion from an attorney. Those situations don't come up all the time, but they do occasionally come up. I'm not going to talk about it in this video, but it would be a good topic for a separate video. There you go. That's what I got on Brown's Chapter 3. So just to review, he talks about a lot about land title, sources of land title. He talks about the sources of conflicts in our land, uh, real estate system, our cadastral system, where those 
uh, conflicts come from and how they're resolved. You know, the court's role and the surveyor's role in resolving those. Then he gives a good overview of uh, land descriptions or legal descriptions, how they work, how when they're screwed up, they cause problems. And then he talks a little bit about why we need land title insurance. And he talks a little bit about the difference between title insurance, title abstracts, and opinions of title prepared by land attorney. All right, lots of good stuff in chapter three. Sorry it took me so long to get to these videos. Hopefully I will uh, not take as long to get into Brown's chapter four. And thank you for watching, guys. I hope these videos help.